is really intended to be more of a roadmap of uh, how what we view as the key technical facets that one would need to address when faced with a very common problem that statisticians deal with, which is estimating uh, historical control. <clears throat> so in oncology, uh, single arm studies with a binary outcome are very common. I think we've probably all worked on these at some point in our, in our time. And the fundamental framework is that they rely on a comparison to a clinically compelling or historical control response rate. The setup of the null and alternative hypotheses are very simple. As, as shown here, the experimental, con, uh, experimental response rate is larger than the control, and the alternative hypothesis, uh, sorry, I think <laughs> I, had, I had it backwards, but the, alter, the null hypothesis is that the experimental response rate is less than the control, and the alternative is the opposite. Um, the study could be multi-stage or single stage, and they could include futility or interim efficacy analyses. And some common examples are the Simon two stage. I think we've probably all seen those. Uh, Simon three stage, I think there's probably a Simon N stage somewhere out there in the world. Um, and they could be user defined. You don't have to use a fixed off the shelf design. You could use whatever, um, whatever suits your needs for the particular trial. So the key bit, even though the trial itself is a very simple design, the key bit is getting the right historical control. This is critical. The implications of getting it wrong are that if you set it too high, you may conclude that your drug doesn't work, you may stop early for futility. If you set it too low, you may conclude there's compelling efficacy when there really is none, and you may waste resources pursuing something that just doesn't have very much efficacy. In a registrational setting, the risks could have even more profound implications. So in hematologic malignancies, these types of studies are very common. Um, and some very recent examples um, come to mind. These are probably examples within the last six years. Ibrutinib in chronic lymphocytic leukemia, belinitumumab in ALL, bortezomib in mental cell lymphoma, carfilzomib in multiple myeloma, and lenalidomide in mental cell. And re regulators are starting to cast increasing scrutiny on how the historical controls for these studies are estimated because they're so critical to the inference. <clears throat> okay, so that kind of brings us to our roadmap of what we think are the key technical things that one needs to step through to address as you work with these studies. So the first thing you have to address is the best way to justify and estimate your historical control. Once you've done that, you've got a handle on what you think the historical control rate is. How would you then use that to design your study? It seems like a simple question, but there are actually multiple ways you could do this. Um, once you've designed your study and you're ready to interpret your study results when you've collected the data, how do you calibrate your historical control to exactly what's in your study population? And then finally, depending on the context, you need to demonstrate that the results from the historical control studies are generally invariant to the patients you've selected to be in your historical control database review. And if you look at um, you know, the, the drugs that I just listed on the previous slide and you look at their publications, you look at their regulatory review documents, the way that sponsors go about this is there's no standard way. It tends to vary. There are common themes that they use, which we've tried to pull out in this presentation, but there is no um, really systematic approach to this. Okay, so step one, justifying the historical control. Some of this is very, very obvious. So the most obvious is find a recent comparator study. That's low-hanging fruit. If you have a recent comparator study, go there, get that. <clears throat> and use that as you know, a fundamental part of justifying your historical control. As part of this, you want, you'll probably want to conduct a literature review in a systematic way to pull together any literature that references the specific target population you are looking for. Even when you do this, you may not, it may not be regulatory scrutiny if you're using this type of um, design for a registrational study. And there could be many um, reasons for this. One is that with what you find in a literature review, what's already published in published reports, it may not exactly match your study population. 
and it could be outdated, right? We've probably all experienced that before, a publication from years ago when the standard of care was different or the response criteria were different. So <clears throat> even after doing this, it just may not pass regulatory muster. So the next step then would be to try to obtain subject level data specific to your study population. And there are a couple ways to do this. Probably the um, most straightforward would be to work with institutions, usually academic institutions, have access to um, databases in which they've collected patient treatment and patient outcomes. Another would be um, payer databases where one can get this information. And the other <clears throat> approach would be to work with academic institutions that have conducted registrational studies or phase three studies to buy data from some of those studies. And you know the, the purchase of the data is, is usually not um, overly burdensome or expensive, but <coughs> usually there's come some tacit agreement that you will collaborate with that institution then in publications moving forward and collaborate from every level from writing the SAP all the way up through the final publication. The beauty of doing this is that it allows you to drill down exactly to your study population <clears throat> and the, exactly the target endpoint most of the time. With some of the payer databases, you may not get exactly the target endpoint. There could be gaps in the information, but hopefully if you've purchased data from some randomized studies, you can get at that a little more precisely. The other thing with this approach is that you can often capture the entire patient history, which is something when you work on a clinical trial, you may not always see that. So you could see the patient's entire history from time of diagnosis up through death, and you can see how they're cycling through different lines of therapy as they undergo treatment for their disease. Um, so this part is basically an exercise in observational research and to some degree estimation methods. <clears throat> So then you have your subject level data. Now you want to move forward to actually getting an estimate for your historical control. So your retrospective data may contain a mix of point estimates from different studies. It may contain information from published reports. So the methods for combining that is, are pretty well established. I think my favorite that I've come across while working through this is that outlined in Der Simonian and Laird from 1986. And the typical steps one would undertake in this, this, this stage of the process would be first to check on the homogeneity of the treatment outcome, right? So across the databases or across the published reports you have, uh, are the results generally consistent? Are there any that stand out as dramatically different from the rest? And I think the most common way I've seen um, this tested is with Cochrane's Q statistic. And this particular statistic is used often, and I think that's just because there's lack of anything better. <laughs> so it's not particularly powerful or um, it, there's no, it doesn't really facilitate the interpretation unless there's something dramatically different about one piece of data. Once you've done that and you've convinced yourself on which set of studies are the most consistent in terms of pooling them together and integrating them for, to obtain a point estimate, the most common way I've seen that done is with a random effects model, uh, where the type of study is a random effect or the, the study of the data source would be a random effect. You can use this to estimate the pooled outcome. And um, Dersimony and Laird is a great resource. The Cochrane collaboration also has several um, useful papers and tools. And as with many things, there's an R package to do whatever you want. So um, I think R, packages ha R has a couple of really good packages for meta-analysis um, to facilitate the computation. OK, so now you have a, an estimate of your historical control. You probably have an estimate and a confidence interval. So how do you use that to design the study, right? Off the top of your head, you think that should be pretty straightforward, right? But there are actually couple different approaches you could use. And at this point, I think you'd probably want to start interacting with regulators to get an idea of what their expectations are. So the most obvious would be to use the point estimate for your historical control, that simple. The next could be slightly more conservative, where you take the upper limit of some confidence interval for your historical control and use that to design your study. And then the third, even more conservative, would be to ensure that the smallest detectable treatment effect 
in your study excludes the upper limit of the confidence interval from the historical control point estimate. So as you can see, these get more conservative as you go along. And this is a, <clears throat> a place where you'd probably want to have a discussion with regulators. The other approach, which is somewhat, um, somewhat different, would be to uh, concede that the historical control may not be, uh, you may not be able to estimate it precisely, and it may have some range, and to design your study such that it can accommodate that range. And the paper I've referenced here um, on clinical trial assurance, this was actually a paper that Ben handed to me years ago, and I had sort of forgotten about it, and I dug it out of my files the other day and realized that it was actually quite a useful thing. And then when I opened uh, EAST, I was happy to see that there is a module to calculate assurance. So that, that was a happy set of circumstances for me. Um, basically, the idea here is that when you design a, um, when you design a study, traditionally, you, um, and you calculate the power, you, power, you design the power, you obtain the power based on a fixed treatment effect. But with the O'Hagan method, you can actually assess the unconditional probability that the trial will be successful over a range of likely outcomes. And this is a Bayesian method. Effectively, the study power is averaged over the prior distribution for the effect size. So in a single arm study with a binary outcome in the most traditional application of clinical trial assurance, you would use a range for the treatment effect size. But you could also put the range, instead of having a range on your treatment effect size, you could have a range on your historical control, right? You'd have to tweak the method slightly, but that can be done in a fairly straightforward way. Or you could do a combination of both, right? You can envision a scenario where you have a range for your historical control and you may have a target range for your treatment effect size also. So when you do this, um, while you may not be able to necessarily um, write this type of design into the study protocol, you could use it to assure regulators that your study is sized appropriately, right? That even though you wrote in the protocol that you were sizing this study based on the point estimate of your historical control, <coughs> in practice, when you look under the hood, you, you are um, able to detect a certain range of outcomes that may make the regulators feel comfortable with how you've designed the study. Okay, <clears throat> so now you have a point estimate and uh, some confidence interval for your historical control. You've designed the study, you you're run the study, collect the data, and now you need to calibrate the historical control or calibrate your study results to the historical control. And what we mean by this specifically is to dial in your historical control estimate to the mix of patients you actually had in the, in the study population. And while this is post facto, right, it's useful for publications and things where you're trying to um, help people interpret your treatment effect. So every study may contain a range of inclusion criteria. So you, know, you may include patients with one to five lines of prior therapy. You may include patients with ECOG status zero to two. And when you actually enroll the study, you're going to have a mix of those patients in your, in your, who are enrolled. And that the proportions of the important prognostic, the proportions of patients with important prognostic factors enrolled in your study may not exactly mix, mix, match the proportion of patients with those factors in the subject population in your retrospective reviews. And so when you're actually interpreting the results of your study, you want to be careful to factor this in. <clears throat> okay, so the, at least at this point in my, how far I've gotten with reviewing some of these literature, the best kind of most comprehensive way I've seen of doing this is um, a method that was described in Statistics and Medicine in 2001. And effectively, what this does, it's a model-based weighted analysis. So you find um, important prognostic factors and you stratify your retrospective database by those factors, and you sample from it in equal proportion to those factors in your study population. So that, that's the, the method in a nutshell. And this was actually done for the um, recent, um, for the 2014 um, registrational package for Blincido. And if you read the FDA statistical reviews, they reference the method. Unfortunately, that the paper in which they've actually um, published these results based on their um, calibration 
is not yet been published. Every time I see my former Amgen colleagues, I torment them and ask them when this paper is coming out. Apparently, it's coming out very soon. So I will, I will look forward to that. And if anyone has any intelligence on when it's going to be published, please let me know. Yes. Of course, of course. Um, so when you say you calibrate them, is it at a design stage you calibrate them or at the analysis stage? At the analysis stage, because that's when you would know who's actually enrolled in your study. Okay, so when, when you have the fully enrolled. Exactly, yeah. yeah. Any, any other questions? Please shout them out when you, when you have them. <clears throat> okay, so just a little bit more detail on um, this method. You, you know, to obtain the important stratification factors that affect the prognosis, you can either do that through literature review or subject <coughs> level data. And, you know, if you're in a multivariate situation, you may want to reduce the dimensionality a bit and get a prognostic risk score. And you can apply this to your historical control data to divide it into strata. And in Mazumdar, um, they actually use bootstrap sampling to sample from the historical control database within the prognostic risk groups to get the, the appropriate mix of um, populations in, in the same proportions as in your study. I'm not sure if that's exactly the method that they used in the blinatumumab or the blin cyto um, application, but we'll know when the, when the paper is published. Okay, <clears throat> the other um, issue which is important to address um, is invariance, and, and it depends on the context whether or not this is critical to address. So when you use subject level data to estimate historical control, as I said, you may have a picture of the patient's entire treatment history. And when you look across the patient's treatment history, you may see in that record in your um, retrospective database, a patient could have met the inclusion criteria for your study or could have been in your target population multiple times, right? So <clears throat> every time they meet the eligibility criteria, you could have an outcome for them. So multiple outcomes per patient. And for lack of a better descriptor, I've just been calling this a multi-inclusion record. And an example would be um, if you were estimating response to salvage chemotherapy in platinum insensitive ovarian cancer, right? So this is a patient's treatment history. They're diagnosed, they're treated with first line platinum and taxane, they respond and then sometime later they have subsequent progression. They are then treated with a second line agent, platinum with something else. This time they don't respond. So this time they're platinum insensitive here. So when they undergo third line treatment, they could be a candidate for your target population, right? And when they undergo third line treatment, they respond to it. Okay, so then subsequently they progress, they undergo fourth line treatment. Now when they get fourth line treatment, they may cycle back onto platinum, right? Even though it seems counterintuitive to treat a patient with platinum, even though they were platinum insensitive before, it's not uncommon um, to try again with some agents that are highly effective because sometimes platinum sensitivity can come back. Um, when they're treated with fourth line platinum, again, no response. That's their second episode of insensitivity. And then they're treated with fifth line salvage. This time they have no response. So you have a response here, the first episode of being insensitive no response or second episode of being insensitive. So which one do you use when you're estimating your historical control? If you've shown with your assessment of the prognostic factors that you set up in the previous step that the line of therapy doesn't matter, it's not an important prognostic factor, you could use that as the basis for saying, even though in this particular case I get a response here and not a response here, in the large sample, scheme of things, it doesn't matter which one I pick, right? Because the line of therapy is not an important prognostic factor. If the line of therapy is an important prognostic factor, as you showed in your previous step, then you would have to be careful when you're setting up your um, estimation from your retrospective data, which one of these you, you, you use. And you may, you know, I've, I've personally not, not really come across a great way of dealing with that yet. It's mainly been brute force in terms of cranking through data sets where you represent each instance of the insensitivity, looking at each one to understand if it matters how you select the, the record for inclusion in your estimate. 
Um, so some ideas that we've had would be to bootstrap sample from the multi-inclusion, from the set of multi-inclusion records each time selecting a different instance of meeting the inclusion criteria. You could try to use this to demonstrate the homogeneity of the outcome, or you could try to model the correlation in outcomes when you see this occurring within one patient. And you know, the success of that would depend on how many multi-inclusion records you have. If you don't have many, it may be difficult to do. Um, I mean, I welcome other people's thoughts here because this is a, an area where I think we've sort of I've, I've hit a wall in terms of what I found in the literature. You know, if, if people have thoughts about how to handle this scenario, it would be interesting to hear them. Okay, and then finally, a few other technical issues that we kind of just make, need to check the box and make sure you've addressed when you're estimating your historical control. So you may have a mix of central and local disease assessments in your historical control database. For um, you know, retrospective reviews that you've gotten from institutions or payer records, you may have a less rigorous assessment of the disease than you would get if you were to purchase clinical trial data. So you need to keep that in mind and factor that in, most likely at the modeling stage. <clears throat> and to the same degree, your historical control may include a mix of objective response as measured per some very specific criteria and just a response as you may be able to deduce from lack of therapy being given. So you should plan some sensitivity analyses to account for this. <clears throat> 